You may be seated. My name is Brad Strawn, and I am the Chief of Spiritual Formation and Integration, as well as Dean of the Chapel here at Fuller Seminary. And it is my privilege to welcome you to Festival of Beginnings. Welcome you in person, and welcome you online. We are so happy that you are with us this morning. It's good to have you uh, both online and here in person. One of the reasons we can be here in person is because we are following the COVID protocols. So we would please invite you to keep your masks on through the entirety of the service, covering your nose and your mouth, and that will make it possible for us to be all together this morning. We'd like to begin this morning with prayer. Will you pray with me? Dear Lord, we come to the beginning of the school year with thanksgiving in our hearts. We are thankful for your blessings, for this place, and for your calling on our lives. We come to celebrate, to learn, to grow, to be challenged, and to be formed academically, vocationally, spiritually, and emotionally into the very image and likeness of your son, Jesus. And yet, Lord, we also come with the realities of this broken world in our minds and hearts. Pain, suffering, oppression, and isms of all kind are still rampant among us. But we know that you, the God of new beginnings, never sleep and never slumber. You will never stop working till shalom reigns in all the world. We are grateful that you allow us to participate with you in your world-changing work all over the world. We are humbled that you have called us to this new beginning, to partner with you in your never-ending work of making all things new. Amen. At Fuller, we are proud to be a multi-denominational, cultural, and ethnic, and multilingual seminary. And for that reason, we will move in and out of different languages today. Some of those languages you might know, some might be your native tongue, some will be very different from you. We invite you in the spirit of worship, inclusivity, and the communion of faith to lean into those moments when we sing even in a language that you might not know. I invite you this morning to stand again in body or spirit as we continue to worship.
It is wonderful to be with you in person and online. Thank you, Lord. A reading from Genesis chapter 18, verses 1 through 20. The Lord appeared to Abraham by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the entrance of his tent in the heat of the day. He looked up and saw three men standing near him. When he saw them, he ran from the tent entrance to meet them and bowed down to the ground. He said, my Lord, if I find favor with you, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree. Let me bring a little bread that you may refresh yourselves. And after that, you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham hastened into the tent to Sarah and said, make ready quickly three measures of choice flour, knead it and make cakes. Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf tender and good and gave it to the servant who hastened to prepare it. Then he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. They said to him, where is your wife, Sarah? And he said, there, in the tent. Then one said, I will surely return to you in due season and your wife, Sarah, shall have a son. And Sarah was listening at the tent entrance behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, advanced and aged, aged, and it had ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. So Sarah laughed to herself. <laughs> after I have grown old and my husband is old, shall I have pleasure? The Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, shall I indeed bear a child now that I am old? Is anything too wonderful for the Lord? At the set time I will return to you in due season and Sarah shall have a son. But Sarah denied saying, I did not laugh for she was afraid. He said, oh, yes, you did laugh. Then the men set out from there, and they looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to set them on their way. The Lord said, shall I hide from Abraham what I'm about to do? Seeing that Abraham shall become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. No, for I have chosen him that he may charge his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing righteousness and justice so that the Lord may bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. Then the Lord said, how great is the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah and how grave their sin. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let me add my welcome to this morning and this great opportunity that we have to share in the festival beginnings. Whether you're here in person or online, this has been a traditional marking point of the beginning of our academic year and the first chapel of the year. This year we want to really encourage as a community all those who are able to be physically present in worship to do so. We're encouraging all offices to be closed, we're encouraging nobody to make meetings, we're encouraging there's no classes that are regularly scheduled for this time. And we want to give this as an opportunity really for a, a Sabbath in the middle of the week to acknowledge that all of us are full of the challenges and work that is at hand. And at the same time, we need to pull away together in the presence of God 
and take advantage of the opportunity to simply be in Sabbath worship together. So we encourage you to come. No one, of course, is required to attend chapel. We're not uh, at all suggesting that. But we are deeply, require, re deeply hoping that you would, I would like to require it, but I'm not going to require it. Uh, I would like to require it because I think it's so important, but we're not going to do that. But we would welcome you to worship on Wednesdays at 10. So please, uh, please, please do come and be a part of it if you can. And if you can't, either because you're physically online and unable in that way or physically not able to be present, then we hope you will take, in any case, an hour of Sabbath on Wednesdays at 10. The text that was just read a moment ago is a text that is such an extraordinary text. And before we ever reach it, of course, in the book of Genesis, we know that, frankly, so much has already happened. The first 11 chapters of Genesis are filled with the opening sequence of the, the book of Genesis. And from creation all the way to the crisis that really ends Genesis 11, there's this introductory arc of both God's creative power and mercy and goodness, and at the same time, human's capacity for unwinding all of that goodness and leaving us with a stew, a mess of things that just are not the way they were intended to be. God offers yet more opportunity for the, a fresh beginning, and still it is unwound. And by the end of chapter 11, it's like, where is there going to be hope in a world like this? Chapter 12 introduces the beginning of an arc that follows from now all the way through the end of the scriptures. It's an arc that focuses principally and both visibly and invisibly through one long family line, Abraham and Sarah. Often this featured character is, of course, Abraham. For good reason, Abraham is considered the father of the faith. There is this long arc that we see honored throughout the Old and New Testament alike about the place of Abram. But today I want us to focus instead, focus instead on Sarah. Partly because in this year we're going to be thinking together about the people of God and the community of faith. That's the theme that we're using this year, the people of God and the community of faith. And we're going to be thinking about different people and the influence they have in the community of God's people and how those stories unfold. And this morning, Sarah is going to get the main focus. The thing that makes this chapter so amazing is that long before this, of course, God has taken Abram out under the clear Middle Eastern sky, pointed to all the stars and said, so great will your number be. This was fant fantastical. It was a fantasy. It was an impossibility. It was un literally unimaginable. And yet in setting the stage, God says that this is what I'm going to do and it will be through you, Abram, and your descendants, a people for myself. And then along the way, he eventually comes to Abraham and also says, now that means that you, even in your agedness, are going to have children more numerous than all the stars in the sky. Abraham gives a belly laugh, just an outright belly laugh. And the text goes on, by this stage, Sarah has suffered in so many different ways. So many things have been done to Sarah, at Sarah, both by Abraham and by other people a sense that she has been, she is both his half-sister and his wife. There's a sense that somehow in that combination, Abraham at a critical moment before Pharaoh, as they are wandering to Egypt, then does a kind of side deal with Sarah, where clearly he has the power and she doesn't, and he is the one who then says, I'm going to actually hand you over as my sister, not as my wife, to Pharaoh. She's taken into Pharaoh's harem, and the story unfolds for years in a context in which Sarah's story is anything but the one that she would have written for herself. She preserved her husband's life, but she also made herself a, and was made to be in a position of incredible vulnerability, and we might even say abuse. In that context, the story goes on, the marriage amazingly remains intact, Sarah comes up with plans of her own in the long wait, which will come later. But what happens in this moment is that now the news is being overheard by Sarah, who stands at the tent as the person that in some way is the representative of God, giving a word of announcement that God is going to say, I'm going to come to Sarah in a year, and to you, Abraham, 
and there will be a son. Now, Sarah, in the privacy of the tent, just inside, one thinks, perhaps the gaze of the other people that were standing around, the text says that she laughed to herself. Like, no, duh. How could she not laugh to herself? This was literally an absurdity. It was beyond the possibilities of her own making or of anyone else's. I may be old, but they were like way old. And it was in that way oldness that they're now being told they're going to have children. After all these agonizing years of waiting for a child to be born, imagining the shame and the burden and the, the sorrow and the sadness and the pain of being a woman in the Middle East in this era, longing to have a child, aching to have a child, and now long past childbearing years, now suddenly a word, a word that a son will be born within a year. No wonder she laughed. Her piety she gets chastised for, but her honesty needs to be honored. She was the person in the midst who actually named and laughed the reality. This is absurd. This is worthy of laughter. It is so outrageous that it would be the case. It's like that moment that I think pairs with it in the opening chapters of Matthew, when in the birth narrative, the angel trying to comfort Mary about the news of her engagement says, no, no, Mary, be comforted because you're pregnant by the Holy Spirit. What? Is that supposed to be comforting? I don't even know what those words mean. There is this extraordinary sense that you and I, in the work of Fuller Seminary, the work of the people of God, the work of the community of faith, the work of people all around the world today because of Jesus Christ, are engaged in a promise that is laughable. We're engaged in a promise that has been responded to again and again, but in the big arc, we are in the laugh industry. You may have come to Fuller to think you're going to study, to think you're going to think hard, to think you're going to work hard, all that's true. But at the core of it, if we don't understand that we have to remember that we have to laugh hard, then we fail to understand what we're actually really doing. We are daring to say as an institution on this opening day of the, of the year and the festival of beginnings that's part of our opening celebration, we are going to laughably enter into the absurdity of a God who makes and keeps promises that are beyond our capacity to even take in. We're going to study and examine and explore and do all the kinds of hard work that every discipline and a serious academic institution like Fuller's committed to and the work of ministry to which we are called and the varying gifts with which we've been entrusted and the talents and opportunities that have been given to us and a world of extraordinary pain and suffering. And we're going to dare to believe that actually offering a cup of cold water is nothing less than a ministration of God's grace. It's absurd. A small gesture, simply doing good, loving our neighbor. Seeing someone who might be an offense, who might be an enemy, who might be a person that we simply want to disassociate with, and we're called instinctively, not so much, but through the character of God's love and mercy in Christ, we are called to move toward the person who we might consider the other, the stranger, the foreigner, the alien, the outcast, the immigrant. We're meant to move toward the enemy, not away. Nothing in our culture breeds this, of course, in us. And in fact, we are at an apex when it would seem that in fact it's never been less instinctive to American culture and sometimes in places all around the world than to move toward an enemy, toward an other. And yet, and yet you're here to be trained, you're here to be scholars, you're here to study and do the careful work of getting ready to serve as a therapist or to be a person who's going to do academic work or a person who's gonna serve in pastoral ministry or in nonprofit leadership or in the arts or in whatever other world God may have been calling you to be in. And in those places, we are daring to believe that the God of the universe is with you and for you. And even beyond that, God is there before you show up. God is there in the life of the people that you will be touching. 
God actually sees the utterly forgotten, the unseen, the underappreciated, the abused, the neglected, the forgotten, and those are among the people that are in the front lines of the people that are called to be part of the people of faith, the people of God, the community of faith. This is an extraordinary calculus that really makes no linear sense. It's not logical, it is an act of faith to trust that the God of the universe knows you and me and sees us and calls us to belong, to be part of this family more numerous than the stars in the sky and to embody in all kinds of acts, ordinary, plain acts and unbelievable, extraordinary acts to share in that work of what God alone can actually do. There's a church that I sometimes preach in which has what I've come to think of as an example of a church kitchen. It just sort of symbolizes all of that to me. This is a funny church where you preach multiple services every morning and you, the services are stacked. It's a strange kind of arrangement and you preach in middle, beginning and end of these services and therefore you pass at different times through the highways and byways of the church to get to the right service at the right time. And one of the passageways takes me through this little kitchen. It's about 10 by 10. And every time I go through that kitchen, which I'm only in for probably five seconds as I walk through the door, suddenly I look on all the doors of this kitchen and it says things like, no, don't even think about. I dare you to try opening this door. Your life might be on the line if you took this silverware. And if you don't clean up the kitchen, well, it's all over. That just distills the myopia that all of us can live in, right? This boundaried, pathetic little world of no, and don't you think, and I've got to be guarded, and everything has to be ordered in the way that I want it to be. And then if we dare to read the scriptures with seriousness, if we dare to let ourselves hear the word, we understand here a word that is laughable because none of that in the end will be something that matters. And all of it in the end will in fact be undone. And we will sometimes despite ourselves be given an enlarged heart and an enlarged mind and a greater capacity for love and a deeper willingness to suffer and a greater readiness to go to unseen or unforgotten or ignored places or intentionally rejected places, or places that we have seriously committed ourselves to avoid. But if the will of God that's unveiled by the absurdity that Sarah is going to give birth to a baby, then I want to be with her in the honesty of the laughter. I want to be with Sarah in saying, this is crazy. And if as you go through the, this year at Fuller, and, in your studies and your scholarship and your classroom settings and your friendships with other people and there's moments when in fact the whole thing kind of spikes you in a certain way like what is going on here remember sarah's laughter know you're actually in good company that she and abraham are remembered as people of faith to be honored the point is not let's use absurdity as the litmus test of our faith let me turn this around and be sure that we're not reading it in the wrong direction. <laughs> absurdity does not equal God's will and absurdity is not our goal, but there are times and ways in the ordinary acts of life and faith in which we are called to be and do something which is beyond our own capacity and which only God could do. And that through you and me is frankly a laughable thing. If it were not for the fact that it is God who has promised it, who has been faithful to it, and who even in this year, here in Pasadena, in Houston, in Arizona, in places all around the world where students are studying this year at Fuller, we say, laugh because you get it. Laugh because it's honest. And as we laugh in the faith, that such an amazing thing would be a gift of God, well, that's what's going to change us. It's going to, 
It's going to change the people that we may have opportunity and privilege to serve. And it's that that's going to allow us to walk faithfully, courageously, and imaginatively into a world in which we are called to thrive for the sake of the kingdom of God in all of its manifestations. May we laugh in love and faith and honesty because we follow a God who is willing to do what is beyond all that we could ask or even imagine. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Dr. Lowerton. Beloved friends, we are here today, both here in this physical place, but also online. And we have to acknowledge how we got here. It's been 18 months. 18 months where we've had to be really careful, where we've had to be separated from our friends and our loved ones. And 18 months where it was hard to laugh. But we have to be the symbol we have to be the people that is able to do that, that the laughter doesn't erase the suffering in any way, acknowledges it, in fact, that even in the midst of that, it's courageous, it's bold, it's defiant hope that rises anyways and brings a laughter to our, to our bellies. So in all the trauma and loss that we've experienced in this last year, and a half, in all the unrelenting chaos that's all, all around us that sometimes feels so overwhelming that we, we can't even sense the presence of God sometimes. In all of that, through all that chaos and, and in our unbelief, and some of us, I, I don't know if you're with me when I say that our faith has even been shaken in the midst of all that, in all of that, unbelief and doubt. God responds to us in this way. Every time I thought I didn't care, even silence is an answer prayer. Every time you wept, I was sweeping to watching over you and no matter what the devil steals one day all these wounds will heal and the road is hard but I'll get you through Oscar Garcia Johnson. My name is Oscar Garcia Johnson, the Chief of Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. Que bueno es verlos. How beautiful it is to see you all online and here. Well, imagine online. So I want to invite you to a prayer of beauty and tension. Quiero invitarles a una oración de belleza you can follow this prayer in English and Korean in your programs. I will be praying in Spanish. Oremos. Dios de tensión y belleza, nos apartamos 
No apartamos la mirada del sufrimiento. Parece que hay tanto en juego en el mundo y en nosotros mismos. Que apartar la mirada sería negligencia cruel. Así que susténtanos, oh Dios. Danos el regalo de lo bello mientras intentamos sobrevivir a las tragedias de este mundo. Despierta a los artistas y creadores y creadoras en nuestro medio, aquellos y aquellas cuyas canciones, pinturas y películas pueden mantener unidas las costuras de nuestra alma cuando se encuentran bajo la presión más dura. Despierta las estrellas, los pájaros que regresan, las flores que nos resucitan cada día, que incluso cuando nos encontremos demasiado cansados para crear, podamos ser sostenidos por la belleza de tu propia creación. Recuérdanos que la violencia y la opresión no pueden conquistar la belleza en sí. Nuestro amor, nuestro lamento, nuestro enojo, son cada uno, a su manera, mensajeros de la belleza en un mundo adolorido. Let us say aloud together, clamamos a ti, oh Dios. And I heard it when you called for him Underneath the sky that fell When you lost your way, little one, I knew Oh, I was watching over you Let us pray. 온전하신 하나님, 항상 너그러운 자비와 용서로 충만하신 하나님이 되심을 감사드립니다. 우리는 아직 우리 자신에게 이러한 친절을 베푸는 것이 어떤 것인지를 깨닫지 못하고 있음을 고백합니다. 우리는 완벽에 대한 환상을 찬양하는 세상으로 인해서 완벽을 향한 내적 요구에 시달리고 있습니다. 세상은 일 중독, 물질주의, 자기 혐오를 부추기기 위한 완벽함의 기준을 세우고 있습니다. 우리가 완벽이라는 신기루를 물리칠 수 있도록 도와주시기 바랍니다. 그리스도께서 온전하라 말씀하실 때 그것은 흠이나 잘못이 없으라는 것이 아니라 온전하신 하나님과 함께하여 우리도 온전하라는 뜻임을 기억하게 해주시기 바랍니다 더 이상 우리 자신의 몸, 감정, 영혼의 등을 돌리지 않고 우리 자신에 대한 긍혈로 가득 차게 하여 주시기 바랍니다 그래야 해서 하나님이 주님께서 약속하신 안식을 우리 영혼에게 허락해 주시기 바랍니다. Let us respond aloud together. 오 하나님, 우리는 주님께 부르짖습니다. Amen. And I heard it when you called for him underneath the sky. Let us pray. God of defiant hope, it is difficult to imagine a world fully liberated from our present conditions. At times, 
feels like to hope is to be dismissive of the sorrow and injustice that seeps into every sphere of society. Would you preserve us as people whose roots are entwined with hope that we would at all times be grounded in what awaits us as we face the harsh forces of white supremacy, alienation, and injustice. Grant us a hope that is deeply connected to lament and solidarity, a hope that isn't naive or neglectful of the hurting, but makes us crave deeper renewal. And if we begin to sink into despair, remind us that you, who will swallow up death itself, have prepared a place for us. Evil cannot endure, so we will dream as we wait. Let us respond out loud together. We call out to you, oh God. Sarah laughed because it seemed unimaginable that God would do such an incredible thing. But by the time we reach the New Testament, something wholly other has also occurred. Far beyond even the extraordinary miracle of the birth of Isaac comes this birth of God in human flesh to be the salvation of the world, to be our healers and renewer to be the one who remakes us, the one who establishes us and recreates us, the one who dies and rises. That is not only a reason for laughter because it is so outrageous, but it is an even greater reason to simply surrender, to surrender in thanks and offering as we begin this year for our sake, for the sake of what God wants to do in us and around the world so that we can stand in those little small kitchens and say, I'm not called to stay here, but I am called to serve here. I'm called to be in places like this, in tenderness, in hope, in longing, and in trust, that the God who we worship is going to expand people's lives and vision and hope to become people who look like the God that we worship here today. Now to God who is able to do exceedingly abundantly beyond all that we could ask or even imagine according to the power that is at work within us, to God be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus both now and forevermore. And God's people said, amen.
conclusion of our service, but there are cookies at tables all around you. Please go grab some and enjoy them. They're really cute. Thank you all for being here. We'll see you next Wednesday for chapel.